Even before Pearl Harbor, the British Admiralty had been passing decoded U-boat messages to the American Navy. Churchill and Roosevelt knew that the Battle of the Atlantic was crucial and that Ultra gave them a vital edge in the fight against the U-boats. In February 1942, the Admiralty received disastrous news. An abrupt change in the U-boat code plunged Bletchley Park into darkness. They could no longer read the U-boat signals. Equally serious was an abrupt change in U-boat tactics. German submarines switched from the North Atlantic and began prowling the eastern seaboard of the U.S. There, the marauding U-boats maintained radio silence. When they did transmit, their signals couldn't be decoded. All over the Atlantic, the Allied Navy struggled to cope with mounting losses at sea. As the crisis deepened, the Naval Enigma team at Bletchley Park worked round the clock to crack the new code, which they called Shark. Since none of the old code-breaking tricks would work, it was obvious that Dönitz had somehow drastically changed the Enigma. For the Allies on both sides of the Atlantic, it was a severe blow. Well, unfortunately, the British lost control of the Enigma and America was left without the kind of vital information needed to protect its convoys. There were an awful lot of protests, and England was very hesitant to tell us that they had lost control of the code. Before the blackout, the Admiralty's submarine tracking room had been able to pinpoint U-boats with the help of the navigational positions radioed between Dönitz and his crews. Now all they had were rough directional fixes on the signals themselves. Toward the end of 1942, the Allies were losing ships at over four times the rate before the blackout. Finally, Bletchley Park figured out what Dönitz had done. Though still believing the Allies could never crack Enigma, he was worried about internal security and ordered the addition of a fourth rotor to the machine. The revolving rotors, with their maze of constantly changing electrical wiring, were the secret of the Enigma. Introducing a fourth one vastly multiplied the number of potential settings. Now the codebreakers would have to build a new type of device to simulate the four-rotor Enigma and pacify the increasingly impatient Americans. It got to the point where by mid-1942, the Americans declared that no matter what, they would go their own way and make sure they'd get a, their own independent capability against the German submarine menace and its code systems. And it became quite touchy as to whether or not the two sides would cooperate. Tensions grew when secrets were withheld from an American intelligence officer visiting Bletchley Park. He wrote an angry report home. To resolve the crisis, Bletchley Park's second-in-command traveled to Washington for a meeting with the U.S. Navy. They signed an agreement to resolve concerns about security and to cooperate fully on the breaking of the naval enigma. As part of the deal, American codebreakers would be sent to Bletchley Park. Together, they would take on the challenge of the fourth rotor. What I think bothered us most was the destruction of the merchant shipping and the destruction of the naval ships. And knowing that if only we could break this wretched code, we could save so many lives and sink so many U-boats. The first chance to get back into the naval enigma came when a fresh set of captured U-boat code tables arrived at Bletchley Park enabling the code breakers to uncover a critical weakness in the four-rotor system. The German four-rotor Enigma, used mainly on submarines, had to communicate with other naval stations that used only a three-wheel machine. To solve the problem, the fourth rotor could be set in a special position 
that allowed the machine to simulate an old-fashioned three-rotor Enigma. With the help of the captured tables, the code breakers worked out the settings of the first three rotors on the bombs, as they had in the past. Then simply ran through all 26 positions of the fourth rotor until they found the right one. Soon the daily settings were on their way to the Admiralty and America. After 10 months in the cold, Bletchley Park was back. The excitement when we got back into the U-boats was terrific. I was on night shift and somebody came running and said, we're back into the U-boats. And it was the one that was meant we were going to be able to go on getting into the U-boats. So that was terrific. It wasn't just a one-off, it was we were going to be able to do it steadily. Churchill was told as soon as possible. It was a great moment. <laughs> Once again, Bletchley Park could help reroute convoys around the wolf packs. Airborne radar and improved escort support helped assure victory in the Battle of the Atlantic. Although only a few of the men and women of Bletchley Park were in a position to appreciate it, the breaking of the naval enigma was their finest hour. By the spring of 1943, they were decoding dozens of messages a day. And cooperation with the Americans was taken to a new level. The U.S. code-breaking unit was known as Arlington Hall, after its headquarters in Northern Virginia. After the war, it would become the National Security Agency, or NSA. Here, the first American officers were selected to join the code-breakers at Bletchley Park. I remember vividly, a group of us were convened in a room there, and the moment we came in, they were told, what you're going to hear today is something you will not discuss, and it means that you will never be put where you can be captured by the enemy. And I was picked to be the commanding officer of that outfit, and that's how I got to Bletchley Park. During their voyage to England, the officers were ordered to tell a bizarre cover story, that they were messenger pigeon experts in the Signal Corps, this aroused the suspicions of an officer who was checking their identity. They asked us whether we had the uh, Army General Classification Test. They said they couldn't find our scores on our records. They said, would you mind taking the test? And we said, no, we don't mind. There were five of us. And uh, so we took the test, and uh, this sergeant graded them, and he came running out. He says, holy mackerel, what scores? You guys ought to be in intelligence. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever met an Englishman in my life until that point. I don't know, I had been full of stereotypes about uh, the English, you know, the distant and have no sense of humor. And the, these were the most outgoing, wonderful people fed us when it was quite a sacrifice. Just uh, enough screwballs to be a real fun. It was the first time I'd ever been involved in my life in any serious discussion, both either about war or politics, with an American. It was there that I learnt for the first time to drink uh, tomato juice. It was the first experience I had with American coffee and American bacon. So it's in a way America was introduced to me through this Bletchley prelude. The Americans quickly settled into life at Bletchley Park. The only serious dispute arose when the British challenged the Americans to a game of rounders, the British version of baseball. We said, of course, we were delighted, you know, our honored allies. So the Americans came and we showed them how they could play with it. They said, what, no baseball bat? We said, no, we, we would just use this brum handle.